All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Happy Friday. So welcome to High Road U. We are a High Road Solution is a qualified provider of CAA credits from AFAE. To introduce myself, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Manisha Mangus. I am the Director of Consulting here at High Road Solutions. I have over 15 years of uh, experience in digital marketing. My area of expertise is in lead generation, and I have spent many years in the consulting field um, helping associations understand kind of the impact of technology on their marketing programs and figuring out ways to, um, unique ways in which to find growth and develop growth and pursue that. So there are many ways to get in touch with me. Um, feel free to reach out to me via Twitter. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, we produce a series um, kind of as an educational service. We're always looking for additional kind of feedback in terms of topics or things that uh, would help marketing association, marketing practitioners kind of in their day-to-day -day lives. So um, you'll notice that uh, our series of topics kind of run the range of very conceptual, kind of academic in nature in some of the topics, and then others are very practical in terms of what practitioners kind of need to use or, or kind of need to know and be able to kind of execute on those tasks. So uh, we like throwing up a, a mix of items. If you ever have any other suggested topics, if you have questions, certainly please feel free to reach out to us um, in any capacity. So a couple of housekeeping items before we go ahead and we get started today. Uh, one, you may have heard us talk about the state of the digital marketing, uh, digital marketing in associations today. There's a survey that um, this is the third year that it's running. It's currently open. Um, the link is embedded in this PowerPoint, so when you download it, please feel free to click on the link and fill out the survey. We encourage you to do that. It's essentially the, start, the study was um, put in place about three years ago, and really what we want, we noticed that there was a gap in the market. There was not any sort of benchmarking or analysis done to kind of say, why is the association um, technology stack as it exists today, why is it not returning the results um, that marketers are expecting it to? Right, it, used to it used to perform very well, and now it's not. So what's going on? What are associations up to in, in the world of digital marketing? So it's a really interesting study. We uh, will refer back to it from time to time. So the 2016 study is currently open. It will be closing at the end of the month. Strongly encourage you, if you haven't already, to participate. And we'll be releasing the results um, around the time of AAC annual, so in a couple of months. Another item for those of you who are local to the D.C. area, if you are um, or planning to, please come by and um, see us at the AAC MMCC conference that's being held, held at the convention center next, next Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we'll have a speaking session kind of in the afternoon on Monday uh, to talk specifically about how uh, a specific organization used um, perceived growth essentially by um, focusing on hyper-targeted um, segments totally throughout their current traditional marketing playbook and went to something very, very new. So we're excited to share that. And of course, you know, come meet us in our booth if you have any questions, if there are things that you want to talk about uh, from a digital marketing perspective, we highly recommend that you reach out to us. And this is a great conference. We're really excited to go to this one. And last, uh, last note before I get started. For those of you who have joined me on my Zoom journey for the past couple of uh, weeks, I've not had a lot of success. I sometimes get booted up while I'm in the middle of presenting. So just hang in there. I will, if you do hear me drop off, um, give it a couple of minutes and I'll come back and I'll rejoin the call. So let's get started. So today, this whole month of June, we're talking about using digital metrics to gain member insights. So it's a really interesting topic because it's a mix of theoretical kind of overlaid with some of the practical stuff that comes to light. So last week, we talked about some basics, the general overview of the topic. So this week, we'll talk about things from a best practices standpoint. And it's hard to kind of say and point to examples of here's an organization that's doing it well. Uh, you know, everybody has a different way in which to collect metrics and to um, elicit insights from it. So really what I want to go to is, is provide a framework, provide you with some Suggestions and best practices. We'll talk about some of the challenges that prevent us, uh, you know, from pursuing that framework, and then some sources that, at minimum, you should be looking at. So, like we said last month, last week, there are a whole ton of data sources that are sitting out there now, much more than, um, you know, say 10 years ago, where we're we're kind of limited in what we co could collect. So, because we're so overwhelmed, because there's so much data out there, you really kind of want to pick and choose um, what you're looking for, what kind of, based on what insights you're trying to elicit. 
So again, at minimum, we'll go through kind of what the minimum what you should be looking at because there's a lot of information that you can pull from there. So that's what we'll cover today. So before we get started into that, just going back to some level setting, right? So just talking about, you know, why are metrics so important? And we know that as marketers, I'm pretty sure everyone on the call uh, will be able to articulate to, to, to anyone who asks why they're so important. And it's mostly because you'll be asked those questions, right? You'll be asked, you know, how are we performing, right? What kind of progress have we made on our new program? How efficiently are we getting to, um, you know, getting to our members, getting to our acquisitions, our customers that we're looking to convert? You know, how efficient is the program or, or, you know, how efficient are we in our marketing practices and our marketing tactics? Are we um, using the right resources? Are we spending the right amount kind of in, um, in comparison to what's coming back in terms, of a, in terms of return? And also about quality, right? So it's a good measurement. It's a way to kind of standardize across the board and find out if your programs have a lot of state of flux, right? So, you know, if your webinar programs perform well, well one month, they don't perform very well the next two months, then they come back again and then they drop off again. If there's like a plateau, you really want to be able to kind of measure that and see like what's happening, what's driving that. Is there some sort of reason? Is it, are we dealing with a seasonality effect? Are we dealing with kind of like the actual technical platform that's just really difficult to use? Is it more the words just not getting out only in the months that it is getting out in the months where we use some other digital medium to amplify our message, right? So there are a lot of ways in which to answer those questions. A lot of questions to ask, but you know the metrics become important because it's a way to standardize, right? So you're looking for metrics that you can put together, that are easy to collate, easy to put together, and then obviously you want to elicit something from it. Which leads us to the point of, you know, when we're talking about data versus insights, they are two very different things, right? So data is raw data, right? So it's information that's sitting out there in an unorganized format or categorized into a certain way. So you'll find everything is the runs into the data bucket, right? So our data bucket is number of page views, number of active sessions, uh, number of people who logged in, number of likes, number of shares, right? So there are individual data points. Very hard to elicit an insight from it, right? So it's very difficult to say, so let's say your management team or the executive team comes back and says, how, how are we doing in social media? It is very hard for you to kind of look at the number of likes on something and say, you know, we're doing great, right? It ultimately, and you know, alternatively, it's hard to look at just the number of likes alone and say that, you know, our content posts performed very well because we had, you know, 20 people like it. What does that mean, right? It's more so, it's just like, what can you do with that, with that data point? And that's why we move into insights, right? So insights are actionable, data-driven findings that create some sort of business value. Right? So it's different from raw data because it's possibly a, a series of data points strung together or interpreted by you to say that, you know what, based on what we're looking at, we can infer a lot more things. We can infer that members prefer in-person education series as opposed to the on-demand webinars. We know this because we're looking at the performance rates. We're looking at attendance and registration rates. We're looking at how information is being consumed in terms of how we're promoting that. And all of that is leading us to kind of believe that, you know what, on-demand webinars, while they're convenient, um, our members like to talk in person. They like the idea of, of, of kind of visually seeing someone networking. They like the idea of an in-person event um, where they are getting educated, where they are learning something, where they are exchanging information. It seems to perform better than on-demand webinars. Right? So that's an insight. You know, another thing, right? So another, I mean, you know, so that's kind of at the program level. That's an insight that you can kind of elicit and infer at the program level. You can do insights that are based on your content as well, right? So things or activities that you're doing online, your marketing activities, you can kind of, you know, come together and find an insight that says, you know, what we've noticed, here's our insight. Our insight is that the social posts that we put that have an image as well as a link are far more engaging and of use to members, right? And we see that because when we're measuring, we're taking a look at the tweets or the posts or, you know, the items that are shared. They're starting to get more shares versus just likes alone, right? People are leaving comments versus just liking it, right? So we're seeing a different way in which to engage. This seems to line up with our membership, and therefore we're making that, that inference. We're making that insight, right? So hopefully you kind of see what the difference is between those data points. Obviously, you cannot make any insights without the data, right? So you can't make up stuff. And, you know, if somebody says, well, you know, I don't know, we suspect that, 
you know, people aren't registering for the webinar because the technology is just not very easy to use, right? So that's a hypothesis, right? That's somebody saying that they suspect it. You know, as a marketer, your job is you want to kind of figure out, like, is that really true? You want to go and look at the data, right? So you pull down the raw data and then you look at different points, right? So as a marketer, you would take, you know, you would take a look and say, okay, let's see the number of registrants, right? Let's see where they failed or, or they failed to register in the process, right? So can we find the last page before they decided not to register? You know, can we look at the number of emails that we received directly sent to a um, customer support email address, or some sort of, you know, reach or, or, or outreach or some sort of help inbox that said or that had to do with, you know, being able to register or being able to log in, right? So those series of data points strung together will then kind of help you substantiate and validate whether that insight or that hypothesis is actually correct, and therefore you can make some sort of additional insight into it so that you can do something with it going forward. Right, so as you can see, all, all, all that kind of comes, comes together in terms of a framework, right? So it's very hard to kind of sit there, kind of whiteboard, stare at the whiteboard and say, okay, what am I going to get, my in, how am I going to collect my insights? What am I looking for, first of all? Where is the data and then, you know, what can I infer from it? How am I going to measure all these insights and actually gain some sort of insight that I can do something with? All right, so what we found useful, and you'll see this kind of start to overlay with a lot of other marketing funnels of just a concept, right? We're talking at about awareness up at the top. So you're thinking about, you know, what do you want to learn from your target audience? What kind of metrics or important metrics from an awareness standpoint would you want to collect that you in turn can kind of tie it together to some sort of user journey, right? So there's an awareness perspective, that kind of bucket of metrics that can go into that. There's participation, there's engagement, and then finally there's advocacy. So when you start to think of it from this perspective, it doesn't become as abstract, right? Now you're really thinking about, hmm, what do I want to interpret based on kind of these categories? So if we're talking from an awareness standpoint, let's take that as an example. From an awareness standpoint, we're thinking about, hmm, let's see what metrics, first of all, can we, can we um, kind of assign to say that if we were looking at these data points kind of randomly or, or individually, right, so what, what data points would fall into the awareness bucket, right? So if you think about it, and of course we're doing, we're doing digital, digital metrics, right? So we're thinking about, you know, likes, number of page views, um, number of times perhaps someone has opened an email, number of times someone has clicked on a banner ad, all of that leads to impressions, right? Awareness, right? They're aware of something, our message that we're putting out there. So then you want to think about, you know, okay, from an awareness standpoint, what kind of insights can I gather, right? So, you know, some of the questions are, what do you want to, right? So, you frame it up in the what do you want to know. So I want to know from an awareness standpoint whether a message one is getting out there, two is it getting to the right people, three are those people doing something with it, right? Is it is it the natural step? Is, are they kind of are they being led down the path so that they know what my what their next step should be, right? So when you start to articulate those questions, that's how you kind of move into um, where you have that movement where you've got you've got your data points and now you're moving into your insights. So obviously you want to tie all of this to your goals. That's the easiest way to uh, to ask to, to find the right questions to ask, right? So what do you want to learn from your target audience and why? You know you can break that down and get far more specific, right? So if you have a new program, do you know if people like it or if they dislike it, right? If you ask that question, then you can start to think about where can I go to get the data? Then let me look at the results of the data and then let me pull the inference or the insights from it. So if I wanted to find out new program improvements, the same thing, how effective are my digital marketing channels, you know, why why is my member consumed one program but not another, right? So those are some examples, right? So it's tying up, as you can see, rolling it up to those goals, right? Because the whole point of this is to elicit insights that you can do something with, right? And that's really kind of one of the items that, um, you know, falls into what we call best practices or common sense in this point. So what I'm saying here is nothing new. It is likely what you've already kind of concluded or you're already doing in your marketing programs today, right? Um, really, my point here is to kind of say it's, it's, it's not rocket science from that perspective. You do have challenges. There are things that kind of prevent you from going through this step, but it's not because you have a lack of drive, a lack of knowledge, or lack of motivation. Those are not the ones 
those are not the factors that challenge you, you know, kind of in following this, this, this set of best practices. But again, you know, when we're looking for insights and we're looking at data, we always want to establish a baseline, right? So you will likely get a question. You probably get it often. How are we doing? How are we doing in comparison to last year? How are we doing in comparison to last week, last month? How are we doing in comparison to when we didn't have the program in place, right? So there's always some sort of uh, comparison because it helps people understand the impact of your programs, right? So that's often why you'll always get a question like that. So in order to be able to kind of answer that, you need to establish a baseline. Now to establish your baseline, you go through the same exercise of like, you know, you're not so much as necessarily looking for insights as of yet, but you are coming down and sitting down and saying, okay, where am I going to look and what questions am I going to try to answer? Let's at least see how we're doing kind of across the board, right? So that's your baseline. But your baseline doesn't mean anything if you've only sat down to do this once and measure everything once and you never come back to it, right? So again, you know, from that standpoint, you always want to measure frequently and consistently. So it's kind of up to you inside of your marketing team how often you want to do it. You know, again, we want to see, uh, you know, as a best practice, typically monthly, you know, everyone does it at least rolling up to a month, right? So month over month, how are we doing? If your marketing teams are in full drive, you've got everything set up, you've got all your reports, you know exactly where things are, you should be looking at it from a weekly basis, right? Because again, all your mar marketing activities are probably lined up around a weekly activity schedule your marketing calendar or your content calendars are probably at the, at the weekly cadence. So therefore, you want to be in lockstep and in tandem with that. The more important thing is you definitely want to think about this from a frequency and consistent standpoint. You want to be measuring uh, on a frequent basis. And then obviously you want to go back and look at what you're measuring, right? Interpret and infer the results. Those are your insights. That's what you're looking at here, right? So we see most organizations do pretty well eventually <laughs> with the first three items, right? So once everybody's kind of on the same page and they have a better understanding of what we're looking for, what we're trying to understand or trying to try to interpret, we establish some sort of baseline. And this is what we assist some of our clients with, establishing a baseline. You know, they get into the rhythm and to the habit of saying, okay, you know, we're going to sit down at the end of the week. We're going to sit down at the beginning of the week. We're just going to go through the numbers. What do the numbers look like? Maybe at the end of the month when we start to interpret, right? But they are in that mindset. Where they often kind of fall off the tracks is acting on those insights, right? So we get to the third point, interpreting and inferring all those results, right? We look at our insights. We say, you know, hey, based on based on our activity this month, it looks like it looked like our blog views dropped off. Why did it drop off? Probably because we didn't have any other sort of, you know, social media references. We were not cross promoting in any other digital channel. So you want to act on that, right? So if at the end of the month you see that your blog views have dropped off significantly and you know what the cause is, the expectation is that you act on that insight, which means the next week that rolls up for the first of the month, you need to be in a position to start to act on those and then remeasure, right? So we often find organizations that get stuck because they've spent a lot of time on interpreting the results or getting results from analysts who interpret that, but then there's not really a clear roadmap as to, well, what do I do next? Right, the whole point of metrics and measurements and why we do this exercise is so that we can uh, refine, right? So that we measure, we see how it's doing, how it's performing, then we refine, and then we measure again, right? So it's a constant iterative process. Um, there's always a lot of effort in kind of getting things off the ground. It's like new projects, you kind of, you know, launch and leave and you move on to the next thing. Metrics and analytics is not something that you ever move away from, right? So it's a little bit of a mental mindset and mental mind shift. Um, your team has to be kind of in that position or kind of in that mind shift, in that mindset to um, have the discipline to kind of stick with it. Sometimes metrics are sexy, sometimes they're not, right? Again, if you're doing it on a week-to-week, -week, you may not see a lot of the clues and a lot of the patterns and the insights, right? But it's the stuff that you need to go through and collect on a week-to-week -week basis so that you can get to the monthly interpretation, right? You know, again, uh, we, we find these are kind of the best practices from that standpoint because it's, a, it's broken up in a way so that um, it's manageable, right, and it doesn't become a burden. So at the end of the day, the most important pieces out of your campaigns are their measurements and what, what's going on with them. And so hopefully this makes sense. All right, so like I said, um, typically in other, when we talk about other topics, other uh, concepts, you know, kind of across the board, 
um, lack of knowledge and kind of lack of those common sense things is not what's stopping you in this in this standpoint, right? So really what might be challenging and why you may not be able to get through all of those best practices to follow is because there's an overwhelming uh, amount of information that's sitting out there. So it's not necessarily time that's, um, you know, your problem or that awareness, right, or a lack of knowledge, as I said. It's really just knowing that there's all this data that's sitting out there and you have to figure out a way in which to sift through it. You have to figure out a way in which to sift through it and identify what you're going to look at, how it combines with other things that are sitting out there, and what you can interpret from it. So you can kind of see, we looked at this before last week, right, here's your digital marketing, your digital ecosphere, right? This is, this is what it looks like. In the past, the AMS has been in the middle instead of the user, right? But now we kind of recognize this is where the flow of information goes, right? But if you look at all these different data points or all the things that are sitting out there containing data, it can be very overwhelming to be like, oh, okay, how am I going to measure this? More importantly, how am I going to figure out, like, what, you know, what insights can I act on? All right, so that is the challenge, right? And that is where most of your effort will lie in figuring out kind of, especially as you sit down to do that baseline of, you know, what data is important to me based on what I'm looking to answer? How do I want to approach it? Do I want to approach it from an individual data standpoint, meaning I want to look at the individual inline applications, or do I want to look at, at the aggregate level, right? So some of it is recommendations. Some of it is, um, you know, preference. Some people like using a certain set of tools over another set of tools. It really kind of depends on you, right? But your biggest challenge is to figure out where you should be looking for that data and for those insights, and then what you should be looking at, right? And again, we see many different levels, basic understanding of, of, of basic statistics, right, basic metrics that are being measured versus some of the more advanced ones. The advanced ones we've kind of put in the category of ratios, right? So now you're sitting down to calculate what's the cost of acquisition of a member? What's the cost of retaining a member? What does my ROI look like? Right, things like that where you're looking at ratios, right? We see that kind of more on the advanced spectrum, but to get there, you still need to collect your basic data. So I'm going to show you some examples of kind of where you should go to collect some of your information. At minimum, you should be looking at across the board for at least some of these data points. Right, so I'll start with Twitter because social media has a wealth of information that's sitting in there. And what you don't want to do is get overwhelmed again and start tracking all these things if you're not going to really use them. Right, so you really want to think about what insights are we looking for and where should we go to kind of um, get the answers. So I'm going to show you, so we're looking at um, Twitter's inline, inline uh, analytics tool. Right, so you can go to Twitter itself, twitter.com. They've got an analytics, analytics portion for every account that's created, and they'll give you kind of a rundown of, of, of all the synthesis of information available to you. You know, you can break it up by tweets, you can break it up by audience, but they have all that information there. So again, you'll start to see this trend or pattern that I'll touch on in a little bit. But as you can see, there's a lot of information in here, right? So when we're looking at, so we have a great number of data points, which is fantastic. So the question now is, like, what are we looking to answer? Right? So because you can't sit down and week to week kind of transcribe or put in a report or say, you know what, you know, here's an X number of tweets, you know, here's the number of impressions, the engagement rate. You can do that individually at a, at a tweet level. I guess the question is, you know, what does that get you? Are you seeing a pattern of behavior that you can draw an insight from? Right? So insights, if we're looking at the tweet activity page for analytics for, for Twitter, are, you know, we can ask questions, are, are we tweeting the right type of content? Right, so you know, based on the impressions that we're seeing, based on the engagements and the engagement rate, you know, what's performing really well today, and should we improve, or is that the ideal goal? So, are we training content that people are seeing? Right, so are we is our outreach large enough, or should we focus on tweets with higher engagement? Right, so some of those are some of the questions that you're looking to answer, and then obviously you would go to this page to answer those questions versus another page inside of Twitter which has to do with audience. Right? So it's starting to kind of see, like hopefully it's starting to see, you see some kind of trends in this, right? So these online tools have a ton of information, right? So one of the things also you can do here inside of Twitter itself, you can go to the audiences and do a comparison, right? So here are, what kind of insights are we looking for here? So our audience base, you know, all of our followers, what kind of interests are they interested in, right? And then how does that compare to the, to the, to the whole sphere? Right, uh, the whole sphere of people who are using Twitter, where does that where does that ranking lie? 
And you want to think about that because it's a good source for building personas. So if you're being asked, like, hey, we need to build a persona, we need to think about what are people interested in, the people who typically interact with us, you know, why is that important? Because it might influence how you create content for them to consume. Right? So thinking of ways in which you gather this information would be very helpful. So that's what Twitter can do in line. So you can do the same type of thing if you were to go to Facebook. So if you go to your Facebook page, again, it will give you a general overview page where you, you, know, you can see the activity um, across uh, the past week or the past month, the past 28 days or so. You can see the page views, right, the posts, the events. It will give you all these statistics. right? So you have to kind of selectively pick and choose where you want to go in line to a certain application and what I'm really looking for. So on Facebook, what I think is interesting here is that it just gives you a really nice representation of who is actually following your page. Right, so you're not looking for, well, I want to know, you can be, you know, if that's part of what you're looking for from an insights perspective. Um, you know, if you're looking to match up your personas and find that, you can. Right, but here I'm not looking for the number of people who are fans. I don't want to see the top performer or the fan with the most uh, friends or network or that kind of thing. I just want to see the demographic breakdown. Right, so, you know, this is for, this is for a personal chef who's based out of Loudoun County in Virginia. Right, so obviously the page, you know, it skews more women than men, which makes sense. That's to be expected. So sometimes you're looking at stuff that where you're not looking, you're not gaining new insights, but you are validating what you do know. Right, and that's always helpful, especially when you're building out personas, when you're making the case for building a new program. It's just every single piece of information you're able to gather or conclude is, is an additive value. Right, so in this case, again, you kind of look at the demographics, right? So women primarily in the age of 35 to 44. Also, I know that they're located in a certain, in a certain city. So most of them are kind of in proximity, which makes sense because it's in Loudoun County. It's based out of that. But you think about it, you know, from your own perspective. Where are your fans, right? If your fans are congregating around certain towns or certain cities, then perhaps it makes sense to outreach them or create a program where you have uh, local events where you can promote them on Facebook because you know your people are there in these, in these particular city centers. Right? So again, an inference or something that you can do to kind of further analyze and see if it works. Right? So that's what Facebook can provide you kind of in line. LinkedIn, same, same, same kind of format and same kind of approach. Again, you can gather a lot of information directly inside of LinkedIn on your company page. So I point this out because we were doing a little experiment also to kind of see, you know, uh, a sponsor campaign and the level of influence that can have. So again, you can see the numbers here tell you a very important story. One campaign, excuse me, of sponsored content resulted in 43,000 impressions because that's what the sponsor campaign is supposed to do. It's supposed to take my campaign and put it in front of a larger group of people who may not necessarily know me because of my page and they're not subscribed to follow my page, but they fit into the world and the sphere of my target audience. Right? So I had a very compelling um, post that resulted in a certain number of clicks with a certain number of interactions. And look, here's my, here's my metric. Here's my insight right here. Followers acquired. Right? So, you know, what's nice about this and what's different from what you just saw on Facebook and Twitter is that I, as the analyst, if I'm looking inline on Twitter and inline on Facebook, I had to make a lot of the um, inferences on my own, which means I have to look at the data points, look at multiple pages, kind of figure it out, and kind of come up with an assessment. I come here on LinkedIn, LinkedIn understands that, and they've compiled a number of data points together so that I can have that inference very quickly, right? And you kind of look at it too, right? So I got more, more followers, I acquired new people, my engagement rate, engagement rate is 1.2 nine percent, which is still lower than the one at the bottom, 2.21 percent. But I gained 11 followers. So therefore, my insight could be we should do some more sponsored campaigns of compelling content to um, widen our reach. So what's nice about uh, LinkedIn is, again, as I said, they start to overlay a lot of the insights, uh, a lot of the data points together to help you gather those insights or make those insights a lot um, more quickly. Right? So again, from a reach perspective, as expected, once the sponsor campaign went online, you can kind of see the light blue line start to kind of do an uptick. Right? Where's my organic exposure based on you know, who I, who's part of my network, who's following us on our page, uh, trends obviously much lower. 
right? So that's the whole point. You may have heard us on some of our other seminars talking about ways in which to outreach and, and develop growth, grow your membership base. Paid social media, right, does that by outreaching your message to a larger audience. Same thing from an engagement standpoint, too. These metrics here are just showing me the same thing, right? I've got, I started my campaign on May 7th. It's gone up, right? Versus the versus kind of the more organic way of, of, of growth. So that's what LinkedIn will provide you with, which is really very interesting. What LinkedIn also talks about, you know, and again, this is kind of a validation point here, but you can take it further and kind of start to do further analysis. But again, you know, from the followers who are on my page, uh, the majority of them fall, in, fall into the senior senior category, so senior management, right? With entry, you know, followed by manager, director, and some sort of executive officer level role, right? So again, you think about it from a targeting standpoint, does this align with where you want to be, right? If it does, that's great. If it doesn't, then you might need to delve further to look for those insights to see why doesn't it, is it because um, all of our stuff is geared towards, you know, a certain age range, right? Are we looking, um, is, our, is our reach too narrow or is our reach too large? Is the groups that we're putting sponsored content in front of uh, really for the senior level versus C level, and what's the difference, right? So those are kind of conversations that you want to have. And, you know, those start, if you remember my list of best practices, those are kind of towards the bottom of the list, right? The, now that we start to collect information, we start to gather some insights, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to act, and how do we refine and tweak? All right, so that's what this all leads to. So if you talk to any sort of analyst, the analyst will tell you they prefer um, – they probably prefer, they probably prefer um, platforms that aggregate things, right? So I showed you three in line for social media, right? I, we looked at Twitter in line analytics, Facebook in line analytics, and LinkedIn in line analytics. What we're looking at here is HubSpot analytics. So what HubSpot does is it takes all of your social accounts, wherever you are, and it compiles them together. So now, if you're an analyst, you probably don't have a lot of time to sit down individually and calculate and computate and put all the pieces together. So what a platform such as this does is it brings all the stuff together for you, right? So you're able to get to those insights a lot, a lot faster. So what this page is telling me, right? So this report is saying, like, here are all your pages, here are all your sources that are sitting out there that we know of, right? Over a period of time, over the past month, here's the number of interactions, right? And what performed the best Right? especially in that first week, which we know that's the biggest growth piece because that's when we activated our LinkedIn campaign. But clearly, here are the numbers for that. Right? And it kind of points out, with 30 interactions, this is a message that had the most interactions in that month. Right? So it helps you. It gives you a way to kind of validate what you've done and then have insight into, you know, did it work or did it not? How did it perform? So what I like about um, platforms such as these that kind of start to compile information together is that they understand that individual data points um, um, make it really difficult to infer, you know, further insights. So what they start to do is they start to overlay things that they can and put it together for you, right? So HubSpot, again, will come back and say, here's the impact of your business. In the previous month, you gained 69 net new fans and followers and had 446 visits from your, to your website from social media. Right, so there's my inference there, right, which is essentially saying that, um, you know, compared over cur current period of time, my cross promotions and the social media channels of my activities that are on my website are working. I am driving more traffic to my website. That, in turn, is generating new contacts for me, and I'm getting fans on, on the actual channel platform itself. Right? So again, these are the insights that you're looking for. These are the things that you want to take and then point successfully and say, we should continue with this program. We should continue with this aspect of the program. This is how we should continue our marketing tactics. Right? So in the same graph, you can kind of see we lost people. Right? So Facebook and Google+, Plus, we lost some fans. Right? So again, it's thinking about ways in which to improve, thinking of ways in which to kind of go forward. But what this does is it takes a load off of me from a time perspective because I don't have to synthesize the data first before making these inferences. And that is why analysts will kind of gravitate to platforms such as these so that, you know, they can see the stuff being put together. So those of you who are familiar with Google Analytics, this should look familiar. Right? So this is, again, this is now website, right? So we've moved away from social media. We're now looking at straight-up website analytics. 
right? So again, at a glance, you can see year over year, the number of sessions, the number of users, page views, pages per session, which is pretty high, seven pages, um, average session duration, about one and a half minutes, which is interesting. You know, you kind of want to think about, like, well, I wonder what pages are performing so well that they're browsing through and breezing through. Perhaps it's a registration process. Perhaps it's e-commerce pages where you kind of move through quickly. You know, and the bounce rate is really low, which is great. Again, though, right, if you kind of look at these and you think just this, right, just this picture here, I'm not sure that you can have enough inference that, you know, that your bounce rate is low, therefore we're doing a great job, right? You always want to question and say, why is the bounce rate that low? Like, that's surprising. I wonder what that is. Like, let's look at the split. We've got returning visitors versus new visitors. Does that align up with what we expected? Right? So what is the most popular page? You know, your next set of questions would be, what is the most popular page you want to look at? Right? So how is that page performing and what's on there? What kind of content is being consumed? Right? So often when you look at analytics um, such as these, they often um, they give you a set of information. They also give you the next set of questions on which you want to explore now. Right? But again, the point here is that Google Analytics has a ton of information. So what you really want to do again is start to think about ways in which to narrow down and really pick and choose what makes the most sense for you and what you're trying to measure. So if you're trying to measure, you know, what's the website traffic? What, what are, you know, what does my website traffic look like? And the question you really want to ask is, am I doing enough cross promotion? That's the ultimate question. Right? People are saying, you know, your website is your hub. Right? People come there for all the information. Your question back, right, as a marketer is, I have all these other digital media channels that I'm using. Am I using them effectively to cross-promote so I'm driving traffic to these websites? Now, if you were to look inside of Google Analytics alone, I don't know that it would be able to, you would be able to answer that question directly. We already know social media clearly has an influence because we saw some of those statistics. Right? If this was the same website, we've seen some of those statistics. When I think of other ways, like what else could be influenced? So one, we're still looking at the overall question of how well are we doing, how well are we uh, cross-promoting kind of across the board, and then we're looking for other insights as well. Right? So typically, an analyst will go to demographics right, and see who's consuming the information and what's that demographic make it look like. So we see an even split, almost an even split between male and female. And then here, what's interesting is the age demographics. So hopefully I encourage you and inspire you to go quickly and check your own Google, Google Analytics to play around with it again and see what's in there. All right, so this is interesting. For most associations, uh, associations are probably killed to be kind of in to see this kind of graph the way it is, right? So we're seeing definitely a shift in the market. We're definitely already seeing that. We know that millennials represent a good portion of the growth for future for the future of organizations. And this is telling us that millennials come to this website already. They're consuming something. Right? They're spending you know, an average of one and a half minutes. They're looking at least six pages on average. They're looking at something. So therefore, you want to think about, you know, and this goes back to the additive view of digital marketing. Are you producing information that's compelling enough for them? One, where are they coming from? Right? So you want to go back to answering that question. Are your cross-promotion channels being effective? Are they all being driven from social media? Are there other places they're being driven to? What are they looking at? And then what else can you emulate from that perspective to get more information in front of them? Right? How do you convert them to becoming those members if they aren't members? Right? What does that split look like? What does that look like? So again, from this graphic, right, from these metrics alone, we can't infer much other than to say we know who's coming. Therefore, can we do something else with that? Right? But this is kind of the stuff you want to look at, but it needs to be overlaid. Right? We can't just independently say based on what we saw in Google Analytics, this is the end all be all. Right? So the intent is to kind of say let's take everything kind of in an additive nature and put it together. This is why Google Analytics has these affinity interests as well. So you'll see affinity categories, in-market segments, all this stuff is designed to try to help the marketer understand who are those people who are coming, do they fit into categories. I think back in the day it was called, um, I don't remember what it was called. It was called something else. It was like a market research where you could go and purchase the data. Right? You can purchase the data and then um, you, know, you can run it through their systems and it would spit out to say like based on geographic location, this falls into the affluent category, this falls into like you know, the hippies and just, just all sorts of different personas or categories that they've done, but that was all manual. What you're looking at here is the digital output of that. Right? So now we're saying like inside of that subset of people who are coming to our, 
to our websites, here's all the other things that they're interested in. They're interested in movies, they're technophiles, right? They're news junkie and avid readers. So they spend a lot of time online and they spend a lot of time consuming information, right? These are people who are number crunchers, right? These aren't an engineers possibly. They're probably people who like to sit and read. They consume data in a different way, multimedia, right? If they're movie lovers, they're probably multimedia, right? So again, you can kind of see the other market in segments that they might have overlap with and the other categories. So the whole point here again is to see if you can kind of map this back or kind of have your hypothesis there to see if this really does map and, com and compute with your membership cross-section, your DNA of your membership as it exists today, as well as your future, your, you know, your target audience. So is this representative of your membership or is this representative of your target audience? So it's very different. If it's representative of your membership, that's really great. You've got a great, you know, you've got a membership that's, um, you know, kind of overlaid onto your growth target. If this represents your growth model, right, for the first time, you're seeing, you're seeing that the higher percentage of people who are non-members fall into these categories, this is where you want to spend most of your time now, right? Now you really want to understand, you know, who's coming to the site, what are they interested in, where's their longest page of engagement, right? So how long do they spend on the page? What other information are you sending? Are they on YouTube? Have they already found you on social media? So now all those questions start to come to light, right? So it's never difficult to find the questions. So finally when we sit down with, with, with organizations, they struggle with the, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? They're able to kind of articulate that at a very high level, but they don't get into the, the probing questions of, well, what about this and what about that? When you start to look at the data, those questions will naturally bubble to the surface. And that's usually because you're marketers and you want to know, right? You want to know you have an inherent need. You want to know what's happening. You want to know how well it's happening, right? And you want to know kind of what more can you do with this. So that was Google Analytics. So now I'm switching back to HubSpot. And the reason I go back to HubSpot is HubSpot is now showing the aggregate view. Remember I asked my question. My question was, am I doing a good job promoting website traffic you know, using all the digital channels that I have available to me? And this is what it's doing. Now it's saying, here are all your visits across all your different channels here, right? So I've got organic search. How's your organic search doing? Here are the referrals. We'll give you a whole list of here are the websites if you click through. Here are all the websites that are linking to you. Here's how you're performing on social media. Here's how email marketing plays into it. Paid search, direct traffic, other campaigns. Right? So my trackable URLs, my banner ad campaigns. And so then I'm giving you a snapshot now. Right? So when we when we do when we do an analysis for an organization, um, you know, usually it's kind of a, a metric, right? It's like establishing a baseline, kind of seeing where they line up. Most organizations don't have such a variety of media mixes going on, right? You'll see a very large blip in the emails, but the other stuff is very toned down, right? And that's the mix we want to see change, right? Because those are the traditional marketing tactics that are kind of getting pushed out the door and we're seeing more of the, the, new, the new age modern approach, which is to leverage all the channels available to you. So again, analysts will go back to the aggregate level because it gives you a sense of performance. Right? So don't forget that. So when you're looking at your individual data points, that's great. You're looking to elicit insights that you can take back that are actionable. You will be likely asked, and probably on a regular basis, of what's our performance? How are we doing overall? You know, where do we want to go? Right? So you want to kind of see this trend over time also. And platforms such as HubSpot and Marketo or Acton or any of those automation platforms will have the data in there to be able to kind of give you that 360 view. So we've gone through a number of analytics and I've not yet mentioned email marketing. Um, and that's deliberate. So it's very rare to be able to kind of say, I looked at one email and the statistics and the metrics that are returned by that one email give me enough that I can make um, some sort of insight. And it's difficult. Most, most analysts will kind of shy away from that simply because it's hard. One email is a blip in kind of your whole email schedule. If you think about the number of emails you send out, Right, and the type that you send out, you know, a promotional versus uh, member communications versus something else, right? And email is kind of a one data point in real time. So therefore, to open up one email and say, based on your open rates and your clicker rates and your bounce rates, you are doing this well, and here's what you should do. That's a very difficult. Um, that's very difficult to do, right? Because it's one. It's simply one data point. Typically, we'll ask for, you know, when we go in and we do our optimum five analysis. 
when we looked at kind of the five key areas around the market and email marketing program, we'll look for trends, right? So we don't want to look at one email. We want to see the emails that you sent over a period of time. What buckets do they fall into? How are they performing overall? But we'll always want to see it rolled up, right? So when you yourself are looking at emails and how well you're performing, you got to take those numbers with a grain of salt, right? So again, open rates, okay. Click-through rates, obviously those are standards. Not sure how much inference you can pull from them unless you put it into context with something else. So we'd like to roll them up to a campaign level. So the campaign will tell you how you're doing from that perspective. For every campaign that you have out there, you will send a number of emails. You'll never, it's unusual to say, I have one campaign, I'm gonna send one email and then I'm done. Right, so typically your campaign spans, like if you're doing an annual conference campaign, it'll, it'll run them you know, nine months or so. Over the course of nine months, you're gonna send a ton of emails, right? I mean, that's acknowledged. You're gonna send a ton of emails. First set of emails are gonna be for early bird or just getting the word out. Next set of emails will be around deadlines. Next set will be around housing, et cetera, right? So to, to be able to kind of elicit some insights from that email consumption, you gotta, move, you gotta group it back up to the aggregate level. So, so looking at something like this gives me a better perspective of an evergreen campaign. It has no end date, it's just started. Right, I have a number of pages that are sitting out there for visits, right? I've, I've received the following you know, submissions, and then here are the emails that have gone out to support that. When you look at that from that perspective, now you can get into perhaps some number crunching, right? Now you can get into some ratios to see what the spend is, right? You can do some more stuff with it. So at the individual email level, um, if you are looking at those, I would highly suggest that you look for a pattern, right? You look for a full number of emails before kind of relying on being able to say confidently, I looked at one email and based on the click-through rates, you know, we should always do this type of content. Or this program works very well, or, you know, email is one of the things that's a supportive action. Because it's easy to execute, it's taken the lead kind of in most marketing programs, but email is always the additive supplement, right? It, it, it should not start and end with an email. What you can do in an email, and here's where you can get some insights, is to see who's reading it, right? So you really want to think about not only who's opening it, okay, that's great, but they could have opened it and then just moved on to the next email. What might be more interesting, and that's where you can pull some insights into, is like how long did they spend on reading it? And then what device did they read it on, right? Those are things that you can turn into insights. Those are things that you can take action on, right? So the example we're looking at is very high engagement, right? And well, 60% actually opened it and read it. And the, the read definition is, looked at it for two seconds or more. So probably this is a member communication piece, right? Highly engaged, which means low churn, low bounce rates. Members expect it, it's a member, it's a member benefit. What's more interesting is look at the breakdown from the mobile versus desktop engagement, right? So this is telling you a number of people, 60% read it on the mobile device, and they'll read the whole thing on a mobile device, right? So your insight here is, one, you probably wanna take a look at what those demographics map to, and two, you want to make sure that all of your materials that you do send are mobile optimized, right? So you really want to think about that from that aspect. So that's the insight that you gleaned from here. Same thing from desktop engagement. So desktop engagement, you want to see like, oh, okay, high, high, high level of engagement. You know, what you want to think about now is you want to track back and see, you know, can you get even further insights? Who are those people who are reading on a desktop? Are they in their office? right? Is it during business hours? What were the open rates? So now let's go back to the email open rates. Because most email applications, email marketing applications, they can tell you the time of day that it was open. So now you want to go back and take a look at those rates, right? And see what time of day. So I sent it out at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. And, you know, was it consumed from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. during office hours at their business work? Now let's go back to the mobile engagement piece. Let's take a look at when was that opened. Was it off hours? Was it early in the day, late in the day? You know, those are the things that you want to think about. So from an email perspective, open rates themselves individually won't be able to give you much insight. But if you start to layer it and combine it with other things, you'll be able to kind of get more insight. So hopefully all of this makes sense and resonates with everyone, right? So again, it goes back to knowing your data versus your insights and what that definition is. Right, and then making sure that you're able to establish your baseline and measure regularly. Right, so there's some, you know, effort and logistics involved in being regular, being being able to kind of consistently track on a weekly basis to see what the numbers look like, 
and then committing to kind of saying, you know, at the end of the week or at the end of the month, we will look at these numbers and, 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 and see what we can infer from them, right? Some of those are insights that are kind of um, triggered by activity, and some of those are just, you know, trending over time. There's no right or wrong way or there's no mix. It's just really a question of what are you trying to answer, right? So you definitely want to think about collecting data from an individual standpoint versus the aggregate platforms. Right, so the aggregate platforms, I'm a high advocate of that, you know, again, as an analyst, those get me the information that I need faster and provides and does the overlay for me so I can make those insights. So I can get to those insights a lot faster. But there is a lot of information at the individual um, inline level, right, that I often go to as well. So you want to think about what makes the most sense and where, what areas do you want to focus on. And then lastly, remember to act on those insights, right? So kind of the tired and true measure, you know, measure, act, repeat, just do it again and again, right? So that's going to lead you towards success. That's what's going to set you up so that at any given point in time, if somebody should ask, how are we doing, you'll be able to answer with um, concrete results, right? And this is the additive value that uh, marketers always look for. What's really nice today is that there are now tools and data in place to let you do that. Back in the day, that, that wasn't, I don't know that we can easily, that we can say that that was easily available. You know, the data was locked in into certain systems, it was very difficult to pull out. You really had to know your data, like you really had to understand what you were asking for, and then the data you got back, you really had to figure out what you wanted to do with it because it was very raw in nature. So it's nice to kind of see all these tools, um, take some of the heavy lifting from a manual standpoint, and put all this stuff together. So um, as I said, I hope all this makes sense on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, the rest of the month, we'll close out the month next week by talking about measurements, right? So I gave you a kind of flavor of what at minimum you should be looking at. We'll talk a little bit more about um, kind of the advanced metrics. So what you can do from a number crunching standpoint, what other metrics and perhaps, you know, kind of framework you want to use to actually track the data uh, and offline, right? So, uh, you know, we marketers, we love our, um, we love our spreadsheets. Right, so I'll show you some examples of what you could do with that. So I will leave the line open for any questions. I see that there's one. All right, great, excellent. So yeah, so I'll leave the line open for anyone who has um, any questions they want to post in the chat. Other than that, have a great rest of the day and have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone.